ever since I uh, started applying higher doses of vitamin D to my patients, uh, I learned a couple of things in the process. And throughout these years, uh, one of the things that got my attention were the vitamin D receptors. And uh, I did some research on this. I even published uh, some articles on vitamin D receptors and how infections play a critical role in the um, down regulation of these receptors and how um, diet uh, also is very important in, in, in aiding uh, the immune system and allowing it to be able to um, rest a little bit more, I guess you could say, and give it some time so not so much autoimmunity is being uh, generated due to leaky gut syndrome. But now going back to what I was saying, uh, one of the things that I learned is that most of these patients who have autoimmune diseases have a certain degree of dysbiosis, have some chronic infection. Um, it can be, like I said previously, it can be viral, it can be bacterial, it can be fungal, it can be parasitic. I mean, there are many different forms of infections out there, but one of the main common denominators that was noticed is that a lot of these patients have uh, leaky gut syndrome and dysbiosis, and it's uh, been there for years and years and years. So the things that I learned about this is that when I uh, address the diet of these patients, we literally are closing down the amount of uh, inflammatory proteins that are going in. And uh, this excess amount of uh, lipopolysaccharides, antigens, foreign proteins that are going in, lectins, you name it, um, they're not gonna start overwhelming as much uh, the immune system. And let us not forget, 80% of your immune system is located in the gut. So if you give time for the gut to be able to heal, that excess permeability throughout time starts to reduce. So in order for us to be able to understand um, the importance of how the diet has a direct impact on how we express our vitamin D receptors, we must have first a basic understanding of how these receptors work. So to begin with, we can see right over here that we have a vitamin D metabolite in the case of calcitrol, and this will travel all the way into the cell and it's gonna bind with the receptor known as the vitamin D receptor. And once this takes place, it forms what we know as the vitamin D receptor complex. Now this VDR complex is gonna travel all the way to the nucleus and it's gonna upregulate transcription and translation. So it can go ahead and make all the proteins and enzymes that that cell requires in order to be able to have normal cell function. In this case, we are illustrating here an immune cell. But now let's go ahead and dive in a little bit into the gastrointestinal lining. So you can see over here, here we have our cells known as the enterocytes. Here we have our mucin layer, which separates both, both environments for our microbiome um, from interacting with our immune system. And as I said previously, 80% of our immune system is found in our gastrointestinal tract. So here, uh, if you have an individual who is consuming gluten, dairy, lectins, and sugars for a long periods of time, you know, years and years, eventually you're going to start having what we know is an overgrowth of certain bacteria, which leads to a condition known as dysbiosis. Now, this dysbiosis may be known as SIBO. It perhaps might be SIFO if you have or a small intestinal fungal overgrowth, such as candida, or sometimes you might even develop the presence of a biofilm. But the thing is, is that you have to understand that we develop a condition known as dysbiosis, which basically means that you have an increase of uh, bad bacteria over good bacteria. There's a prevalence of more bad over good. And this causes a lot of inflammation in the gut, which ends up affecting the tight junctions that we have between these two enterocytes and makes it more easily uh, 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 porous, I guess you could say, or this is what actually causes what we know as the leaky gut and as we discussed previously. So now all of a sudden we start having all of these antigens and proteins and bacteria and uh, um, lipopolysaccharides that also enter and start interacting with the immune system and the first line of defense as we, as we always say, which are the antigen presenting cells, such as the dendritic cells and the macrophages. And these will eventually interact with the acquired immune system, which we have our T cells and our B cells. And we know that our B cells are gonna eventually transform into plasmatic cells and they're gonna make antibodies to be able to try to um, form those immune complexes to be able to eliminate those antigens. But what happens is that over time, if this diet is not changed or corrected, you start getting a buildup of all of these antigens and, and um, lipopolysaccharides, endotoxins, exotoxins, mycotoxins, which start building up throughout the years. And now all of a sudden you get overwhelmed and you start overwhelming your immune system. 
but we have a couple of systems that are built in that are trying always to make things always keep everything in check and as we can see over here we have our liver and we know um, our liver is one of the main organs that helps making certain uh, uh, lipoproteins that are going to eventually help us out to be able to eliminate the excess amount of toxins. But as we just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, um, the B cells eventually also transform into plasmatic cells and they make these antibodies, which are going to make immune complexes to try to eliminate and eradicate those uh, lipopolysaccharides, endotoxins, exotoxins through the hepatic pathway. Now, these uh, lipoproteins, we have a whole bunch of them as our high density lipids, low density lipids, uh, very low density lipids. Um, they're made also whenever we have excess amount of uh, dysbiosis, as you can see over here, all of these antigens. And it, it, one of the ways of how our body tries to eliminate that excess endotoxemia is by making more HDL, okay? So now there's a protein by the name of uh, lipopolysaccharide binding protein that will assist your high density lipids or HDL by binding together and allowing for the lipopolysaccharide, that endotoxin that we just mentioned, to, to form this complex. And this is gonna eventually be taken out through the hepatic pathway, right? And, but the thing is, is that if this diet continues, right? If this individual is still consuming gluten, dairy, lectins, and sugars, and this dysbiosis is still persisting, and we still have this ongoing leaky gut over here and overwhelming your immune system. Well, eventually what happens is that we just continue to make too many inflammatory markers. And here we can mention a couple of them. We, we have interleukin-6 and we have TNF-alpha, tumor necrotic factor alpha. And we know that these um, inflammatory biomarkers actually inhibit your HDL from being made. That's trying to, that's actually one of the things that your body's trying to eliminate is the excess amount of endotoxins. But whenever you overwhelm your immune system, now you, all of a sudden you start making more interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha, which basically shuts down the production of HDL. And curiously, you start making now what we know as C-reactive protein. And we know that C-reactive protein increases the production of LDL. So this is one of the reasons why whenever we're looking at patients who have autoimmunity, usually you're gonna be seeing an altered lipid profile, all right? Now, whenever you have too much dysbiosis, and sometimes these patients might have a condition known as SIBO or CIFO or the presence of a biofilm, which in the worst case, you need to actually uh, treat these with biofilm disruptors, we have to consider the use of herbal antimicrobials. These herbal antimicrobials may be like um, uh, antibiotics, such as we mentioned previously, previously such as oregano oil, berberine, um, garlic, uh, juniper. Um, there are a whole bunch of them out there that are available and they're used for a specific reason, right? So this is one of the reasons why we use herbal antimicrobials to be able to treat dysbiosis. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that sometimes whenever you're treating a patient who has too much overwhelming um, dysbiosis, they might have SIBO or CIFO, and you start giving them a herbal antimicrobial, such as oregano oil, for instance, and then all of a sudden you start getting all this die-off effect, which means all of these bacteria are starting to die, these bad bacteria are starting to die, but they start limiting too much of a, too many toxins, which make their way through uh, into the uh, bloodstream. And obviously, since we still have ongoing leaky gut, you're going to start overwhelming your immune system and this actually might even make it worse but it's a transitory thing that usually happens when you start treating patients who have autoimmunity all right so that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that herbal antimicrobials despite the fact that they will treat the infection but sometimes they will cause a die-off effect and that's something to always keep in mind all right now so once we have these lipopolysaccharides which are endotoxins and they bind to the tlr receptor um within an immune cell for instance okay this upregulates a series of pathways. Here we have two different pathways known as the MYD88 or the TRIF pathway. And this is going to upregulate the production of, a, of, a, of an inflammatory biomarker by the name of NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B is going to increase the production of interleukin 1 beta and tumor necrotic factor alpha, which downregulates the expression of vitamin D receptors. So now all of a sudden, now this cell has very little um, expression of vitamin D receptors. And uh, whenever you want this vitamin D to be able to bind to its receptor, it's going to produce very little vitamin D receptor complexes, not enough to be able to upregulate more vitamin D receptors. And the reason why is because we just have too much of an infection ongoing, too much leaky gut, uh, too much overwhelming of the immune system by the presence of persistent leaky gut syndrome. All right. And as the same thing, as I said about bacterial endotoxins, the same thing can actually be said about mycotoxins, such as aflatoxin B1, B1, deoxynovenol, uh, we also have xeralanone or candidolysin. These mycotoxins 
actually act through the same pathways as, as I just mentioned, which is the NF kappa B, which ends up producing interleukin 1 beta or and a, a TNF alpha. So the end result of all of this is that there's going to be a reduction in the expression of vitamin D receptors, which is going to reduce the immune function, the ability of your immune system to be able to defend you. Um, it's going to increase inflammation, and obviously this is going to increase the risk for the presence of autoimmunity. Now, the moment that we start treating the patient and we reduce all the consumption of gluten, dairy, lectins, and sugars, right? And we take that away from that patient. All of a sudden, we start noticing that, that this dysbiosis that was existing previously now starts getting better. And you start reducing that dysbiosis, allowing now for eventually um, these enterocytes to heal and those tight junctions to bind once again, bond uh, accordingly to be able to close down that excess permeability. Now, eventually with time, all of those antigens that were circulating in there, you know, and all those lipopolysaccharides, endotoxins, exotoxins, mycotoxins, they start disappearing progressively through time. And this is good because we're giving our immune system less work and less, we're overwhelming less the immune system, which eventually in time, we go back to our normal cell function. So when these lipopolysaccharides or endotoxins or ectotoxins or mycotoxins are eventually through time eliminated from circulation, what happens is that we end up downregulating that inflammatory pathway, and now we allow vitamin D to be able to bind to the receptor, upregulate once again that formation of that VDR complex, and then hence express once again our vitamin D receptors for that cell in order for that cell to have a normal immune cell function restored once again. All right, so this basically um, sums it all up and explains why it's important to treat the dysbiosis of the patient whenever you have an autoimmune condition. And this is what is exactly the vitamin D receptor renewal through anti-inflammatory concept about. Now, the Coimbra protocol uh, teaches us that we have to always be monitoring, you know, calcium levels and also monitoring its the, the antagonist of vitamin D, which is in this case, the parathyroid hormone. So the main goal of the Coimbra protocol is to try to inhibit PTH levels as much as we can, keep it closer to the lower reference levels and elevate our vitamin D levels as much as we can. So not, let's not forget these are antagonists. So the higher your vitamin D levels, the lower your PTH and vice versa. And curiously is that usually the majority of these patients who have autoimmune diseases, um, they have a, a state of low vitamin D or vitamin D deficiency or vitamin D insufficiency. And the goal here is that we know that vitamin D uh, has more than 80 different functions in the body, but one of the major functions is that it's an immune modulator and an immune regulator. So it plays an important role in regulating and making sure that your immune system doesn't overreact uh, and doesn't take you through an inflammatory route. And curiously, patients who do have autoimmune diseases, they have usually not only a vitamin D, low vitamin D state, but they have a, a, a lot of dysbiosis, a lot of dysbiosis. So one of the things that I discovered is that when you change the patient's diet and you reduce the amount of ongoing uh, intestinal permeability and the amount of lipopolysaccharides and endotoxins, exotoxins that are going in, the interesting part about this is that when the immune system is not overwhelmed with all of these toxins, we give it time for those vitamin D receptors to be once again again upregulated and be able to express themselves on the surface of the cell and that way vitamin d is going to be able to come in and it's going to be able to bind to that receptor and do its main function so by changing the diet uh, and uh, improving or treating the infection um, these patients tend to do much better now curiously um, in our practice at least more than 85 percent of my patients have uh, vitamin d polymorphisms, genes that are affecting the methylation cycle. So it is important to always compensate these genes. Uh, and that's one, one of the things that the Coimbra protocol does is that it focuses in, in uh, compensating these genetic polymorphisms. Now, there are many things as well that must always be taken into consideration because there are certain drugs that can affect, you know, the metabolism of vitamin D. Um, a lot of these patients, you know, who have an immune, autoimmune condition sometimes might be taking, you know, what we call corticosteroids. And we know that corticosteroids upregulate an enzyme which basically destroys your vitamin D. So it's that you're giving the patient a drug that's meant to help them, but at the same time, you're making them worse in regards to vitamin D deficiency. Because this enzyme known as 24-hydroxylase degrades calcitrol, which is the actual active hormone of vitamin D. So um, this led to, to the development of a uh, new concept that I call known as the vitamin D 
uh, receptor renewal through anti-inflammatory diet. Um, and it has had a humongous impact on my patients. Um, the fact that I know that giving them these antimicrobials, you know, these supplements such as curcumin, alpha lipoic acid, garlic, all of these things also enhance the expression and upregulation of vitamin D receptors. So you might actually have a genetic polymorphism in your vitamin D receptors. This is one of the reasons why we uh, give higher doses of vitamin D to be able to saturate the receptors. But at the same time, um, you might actually have an infection that's downregulating your receptors. This is why treating the infection improves the outcome for the patient who has an autoimmune disease.